why did you do this? So he said, well, I know that you uh, would like to eat me. So if I had cut the neck very early, then you would have eaten me up. You have no morals on this question. But I felt that if I cut just before the farmer comes, you will be more worried about the farmer coming and uh, catching you uh, and giving you a good beating. And therefore, you will be more interested in saving your life than taking my life. And that's why I waited. So therefore, Bhishma said, have an alliance where you know when to get out of it. Then you can have an alliance with an enemy. Uh, and otherwise, you should not ever have an alliance because the first thing the enemy would do is to solve it. So like this, there are so many such uh, political advice given in our scriptures that I would say that uh, it's very difficult to keep religion out of politics if you want to do uh, politics, if you want to really conduct politics in a moral way. But you certainly should keep politics out of religion. So, however, I'll take great care to minimize the uh, political content of my speech. And certainly at question time, you're there to uh, control which questions will be allowed or not. I today want to speak about an uh, important aspect of our daily life, and that's called the mindset. And mindset is actually how we respond the outlook we have to respond to events that happen to us. There are many events which unfold in your life. Some of them give you pain, some of them give you pleasure, some of them give you happiness, some, some, some of them give you grief, some of them give you success, and sometimes failure. So you have to know how to respond. Uh, and that is called the mindset. And there, Gita, in uh, various shlokas which I'll take, uh, take you through, explains very clearly what should be the mindset. And that's what I would like to begin with. First and foremost, I'd like to read out shloka number 47, which is in chapter 2. Swami's uh, Gita. I think it's from any huh? Yeah, okay. They, I'm thinking it from Sachidanand, uh, Ganapati Sachidanand Swamiji's uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. And what uh, Krishna says to Arjuna in uh, Shloka number 47 is this. Your right is to work only and never to its fruit. Many would have been told this a number of times. Let not the fruits of action be your motive, nor should you be attached to inaction. That is, you have in life only freedom of action. You can never tell when the fruit of that action will come to you. There is, to use a mathematical term, there is no linear relationship between your effort and the getting of your fruit. In life you must be have found that there are often when you work very hard for something you get nothing. And sometimes you work very little and you get a lot. And uh, that's the principle essentially what Lord Krishna says. You'd be surprised that Business Week about two years ago had an article saying that corporate executives in America are being taught uh, Bhagavad Gita and its content to reduce stress. It turned out that stress arises because you have this ego attachment that your efforts must produce results. And you are constantly stressed whether you are putting enough effort or you are capable and you therefore uh, you make a, a heroic effort to succeed. But actually the stress-free approach to uh, action is to act, to work towards a goal, but at the same time to know 
that the outcome is not in your control. The outcome is, as Krishna says, is, a, is a, his uh, account book of karmas and it will be put together and uh, on that it will be decided. You can pray to God for success and then God will reschedule your good karmas to get come. It's like getting provident fund, you know, getting your provident fund a little early. Uh, it's there to get uh, for you to get at the end of your at the end of your active life and when on retirement. But you can get a little in advance as a loan. So therefore, or as a you know as an earlier installment. The same way, Gita makes it very clear that ultimately all results are going to depend on your karmas. And those karmas are including, inclusive of your Purva Jarma karma. And this karma philosophy is the only one which explains life. I don't know of any other religion which has an explanation why sometimes you get nothing after a heroic work for it and sometimes it all suddenly comes without any work. Or why a completely incompetent person compared to you, uh, gets, uh, you know, gets uh, recognition for something where you uh, are denied that recognition. So this, uh, this uh, dilemma we face in life, and we say life is unfair. But what actually, and that leads to stress. And stress has led to a very high cardiac problem in the American executives. So they are now saying, yes, you have to work for company goals. But your freedom is in the choice of actions. What comes out, what the results come, that of course is totally dependent on me. It's what Krishna makes it very clear. So that's the first thing I should say. So he says, uh, Gita Asan say, uh, uh, raises the question, how should this action be performed? And here again you have a shloka number 41 in chapter 2 uh, and that is uh, on page on page uh, uh, of this book is 31 I think uh, and what it says is this uh, shloka number 41 uh, and says, in practice of this yoga, O Arjuna, there is but a single one-pointed determination. Multifarious and innumerable are the decisions of the infirm in mind. In other words, if you are going to do something, block out everything else. Just focus on this. And that's the only way you will be able to reach your goal. So in our country, in our system, ours in India, people have got so many thoughts in their mind. Halfway through they will think of another route. That's not the way to do it. In fact, when Drona was asking Arjuna, when Arjuna pulled his bow to kill a bird, he said, what do you see? He said, I see the iris of the eye of the bird and nothing else. That is called single-pointedness. Gita says you must have single-pointedness. When I was uh, doing this uh, 2G spectrum matter in Supreme Court, people came in, this, this corruption also you should take up, that corruption also you should take up. I followed the Gita, I said I'll take up 2G and nothing else. Other things, uh, you know, other people can take it up. This business of doing a little bit of everything and having all these ideas float in your mind is usually the cause of why you have a failure. And that failure is because you are infirm in mind. You are infirm in mind because you have multivarious thoughts. When you decide to do an important project, then the mindset should be that there's nothing else matters. And there, there you, you focus on it. So this is the second thing. First is, you have freedom of action. But that freedom of action should be exercised. 
with total concentration on achieving that objective. Nothing else should matter. Of course, when you say nothing else matters, it doesn't mean that um, uh, means don't matter. Of course, means matter. But your, your whole dedication should be to achieving it. And that's why it says that uh, in, uh, in, uh, again in Shloka 15, uh, uh, in, uh, in chapter 2, uh, let me read that also out, which defines how the fruit is. So he says, Krishna says, O oh, great among men, that wise man who remains the same in pain and pleasure, and whom these emotions do not afflict, is indeed fit for immortality. And there's another shloka which says, Supitakarya gives you the series of opposites and say that these series of opposites uh, ought to uh, you should be not affected by either. You should not be, you should not be uh, delirious in victory. You should not be depressed in defeat. Uh, they should all be moderated. It should be, a, uh, both should be treated as two sides of the same coin. So, A, your action, you're free. B, you should be single-pointed. And three, the results of those actions are not in your control. But, once the results come, you should neither be exhilarated because you won, nor should you be depressed that you lost. And you should, this requires a great deal of mind control and meditation and so on. But ultimately, by a process slowly of moderating, you will be able to achieve this objective. Now, uh, uh, there is a, a now a lot of American books which are being written, recycling all this without giving credit to Gita. Uh, I think uh, that Deepak Chopra has done a billion dollar business on this. Uh, much of what he says is really already there, but he writes it in, in, in American English. And, uh, and it, it's fine, I mean, it's, uh, it's entrepreneurship, and, he, and he's made a, a success of it. But there are other reports which have also come out. And some of them are now classic texts in uh, school, in psychology courses. In Stanford University, uh, there is a professor by name Carol uh, Dweck, and uh, she has classified mindsets into two, two types. The first mindset she calls as the fixed mindset, which is uh, where you say, I know my limits, I fail because I'm a failure. This is the, uh, the, the kind of a pessimistic uh, outlook that one has. Then she says there's a growth mindset, and this growth mindset uh, is, I really have no idea the extent of my potential, but if I have failed, it is because I have not, I have to retool myself and retry to realize my potential. And uh, retrying is absolutely essential. As you know that Islam failed to come to India because repeated invasions were defeated. But finally, it was uh, Mohammed Ghori who came how many times, I don't know, some say 16 times, some say 10 times, 18 times, something. But in the end, he won. And that's how Islam was established. Of course, the problem was also with our culture in the sense that we had rules of warfare, which you will not find a parallel anywhere in the world. Uh, one was that war will not start till the sun rises. And war, uh, the battle for the day will end when the sun sets and you come back to your tent and have a good night's sleep and then return back. Second is the war will not be in the agricultural fields, it will not be in the cities or populated areas. It will be an open meda. So, Kurukshetra was an open meda where the war took place. And uh, similarly, when Ravan had to confront Rama, 
He didn't say to Rama, you come inside my fort. He came outside the fort and fought in the open Maidan. So that was the second principle. And the third principle is that if you are defeated and you say, I'm sorry, then you return everything uh, and say, okay, goodbye. Give him a good goodbye also. And uh, unfortunately, Prithviraj Chavan said goodbye to him 16 times or whatever number of times, when he should have really had the sense not, not to do it for more than two times. You should not forgive somebody more than perhaps two times. And he gave, forgave him. For, but that was our culture. And the people who came did not realize this. I mean, they did not observe this. And they attacked at night, they attacked in the cities, they had mayhem in the, in, the, in the population centers, they destroyed the crops. And so it was a new thing. It was only after Shivaji emerged in the, in the, in the scene that the new models of warfare, new methods of warfare, including guerrilla warfare, was perfected by him. So consequently, uh, the, uh, the issue is that, that you, know, you, you cannot ever, you should not ever accept failure. And that also comes out in, uh, in the Gita because it says that in the result is not really your determination. You will get the value of your karma someplace. There will be a karma account which God is supposed to keep. And in that karma account, somewhere or the other, you will be able to cash it. It may be in, in, you know, you may not get it in one area, but get in another area. You might get a very good wife and a very bad job, or the vice versa, a very bad job and a very, very good, bad wife and a very good job. So, you know, it's, uh, we have in Gita, the mindset is that life balances itself. And therefore, that is another aspect that you share. So this realizing this potential, is the uh, real, uh, real question. Now, uh, therefore, I would say, your mindset should now work towards getting rid of anxiety. Anxiety comes about the fear when you start thinking about the future. And the future is unknown. And then you imagine the worst possible scenario. And that is what is anxiety leads to stress, and stress leads to disease. It generates uh, chemicals in your body which ultimately uh, affect your health. So stress management requires this mind stillness on this. And that's why yoga is, is, is brought in. And then the uh, future is something that we worry too much, particularly Indians, they worry too much about the future. Not that they can do anything about it, but all the time. I keep getting asked, uh, asked uh, that in the future, supposing you are killed, what will you do? You are taking all these uh, cases against very important people. I said, how can I? I've got to die one day anyway. But the issue is that why should I think about this, such a possibility? Oh, well, you know. Supposing I start from early in the morning from my house for an appointment, a very important appointment, maybe something that my job or something, and on the way I can land into a traffic jam. Now you, you will say, my God, this traffic jam, maybe the appointment will be cancelled and I'll lose a great opportunity. So that's one way of thinking and you sweat about it, you sweat about it. And this produces great deal of uh, bodily changes through these chemicals which are released by the brain. Now, if you were a positive person, you would say, I left early enough. Uh, traffic jam is something I did not accept, I expect. And now what has happened? I'll just relax in the car, maybe turn on the radio and listen to the music or put on some cassette and enjoy, you see, the, uh, the stillness of the traffic jam. And maybe this appointment that I would have got would have led to a job which is, uh, which is not to my, good, my future. That maybe because I didn't get this, I will get another opportunity to get a better job. This happens. Uh, it happened, it's happened to me many times that I've been denied something and then I ended up doing something better. Uh, I remember when I left my professorship at Harvard, went and became professor at IIT. And uh, I was campaigning against socialism, 
saying that the growth rate will never increase in our country unless we undertake we change to the market economic system. Mrs. Gandhi was in power. She was so angry when she saw. And because I got publicity because of our, our ex-Harvard professor, IIT professor, so a lot of publicity damning the uh, socialist system, the Soviet model. So one day I got a letter of dismissal uh, saying, you are dismissed. Now I raised it to the director, how can I be dismissed and I am a full professor. And I have no inquiry, nothing, just you sent me a letter that if I, and they sent it to me 10 minutes past 5 o'clock, that effective from 5 o'clock you are dismissed. And they even came and took my luggage and all from the house and all my uh, goods and threw them out uh, on the road. I mean, I was living in the campus housing at that time. Now, everybody thought that, you know, that's the end of me. But uh, sooner, uh, I was, uh, because of some of my writings attracted political attention, I was, uh, you know, inducted into parliament. And because I was inducted into parliament, and the Janata subsequently after the emergency came to power, uh, I was appointed by Moraji Desai on the board of governors of the very body which dismissed me in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and Moraji, in order to show sympathy for me, he also dismissed all those members who dismissed me in the first place. <laughs> appointed a new board. And I was on the board of governors, I was in the IIT council. And uh, later on, of course, I had also gone to court against my dismissal. 22 years later, I was reinstated by court. <laughs> and the court gave me all my back salary without doing any work. <laughs> so I landed with 25 lakhs in my pocket, and so on. Now you tell me, was the dismissal a bad thing? It was not a bad thing for me. And, uh, and it also enabled me to do politics and uh, teach at Harvard at the same time. I mean, I have uh, academic interests also. I was able to. So I feel that if you really look behind, look back, right back, and take a positive attitude, anything bad happens to you, maybe it's happening for something better. And you take that attitude, this is what uh, Gita says also, and that's the inference you can draw, then you will certainly be uh, better off. Now, uh, uh, I, I think what happens is when you start thinking too much about the future, you become risk averse, and that's the worst habit to have. You must be capable of taking risk, because you have to calculate the risk, you can't be wild and so on. But without risk taking, you cannot achieve anything. And risk, you see, is something where either you will, you will end up you know, in a very bad way, and uh, of course then you must learn to get up again and try again. Or uh, you may get a huge bounty. Uh, at the end of every class at Harvard, which has students from all nationalities, particularly Indians are there in large numbers, I ask one question now when you take up careers. What kind of career will you take up? One where you join in and you are guaranteed the job and every year your salary will be increased by by maybe 1% or 2% or whatever, there will be annual increments and some of the money or your, your salary will be put in provident fund and at the end of uh, 60 years or 65 years or 70 years, you will get a, uh, you will retire and you will get a provident fund. That kind of job you like or a job where you might become a billionaire or you may end up on the street. What kind of job would you like? And I pose this question to my class. Uh, the American students usually ask me, what's the probability I'll end up on the street uh, in the risky alternative? But the Indian students will be, 99% will say the first job is better. <laughs> and when I say, why the first job? Because there's guaranteed poverty. They say, at least it is guaranteed, that's what's important. <laughs> Even poverty is better if it is guaranteed. <laughs> this is the Indian mind, which is always searching for uh, safety. For, for certainty. But life is not certain. And therefore you must learn to take risk. And if you take risk with the knowledge that no effort goes waste, and if you have done it for a good cause, it will be good karma. And that will go into the account and ultimately you will be benefited. So this 
Without taking risk, you will never become, you can never excel. For excellence, you need to take risk. For mediocrity, you can avoid risk. If you want to be a bureaucrat, that's a different matter. But if you want to be something, you want to achieve something, you should have the gumption to take that risk. And this is, uh, uh, th this, if I may quote from Krishna in uh, chapter 16, uh, Shloka uh, 24, uh, He says, this is towards the end of the Gita, therefore the scripture is your authority. If you want to know what kind of actions you should take, this is what Krishna says. Uh, the previous shloka in fact says that ignoring the ordinance of the scriptures, he who acts under the impulsion of desire will never attain happiness. Then he says, therefore the scripture is your authority in deciding what is to be done, what is not to be done. Knowing what is ordained by the scriptures, you perform your duty. So this is the key thing. You, you need a guiding, uh, guiding light and that your scriptures are there. In the simplest form, which is the Gita. But then if you really uh, develop, you can look at your Upanishads. And uh, you can get, uh, and then or you can look at the Yamas and the Niyamas and so on. There are, there's no end, I mean, for character development, the Hindu thought is, uh, has plenty of this. So, th then ultimately, uh, what, uh, what we say is that the concept of intelligence according to the Upanishads is not what we today think. Today, you ask any student, I went to the IIM, IIM Indian, Indian Institute of Management one day to give a lecture and I asked the class, which is a large class because all the, both the two years of MBA were there, I asked them why did you join the MBA course and uh, I asked a few people to put up their hands who wanted to answer, five people put up their hands uh, and uh, I asked them all five, all five said only one thing because the IMM is the surest way to get a good job. That is why we are IIM. I said, you have no love for the, uh, you know, theory of marketing or the theory of finance. That you are, you are, uh, no, no, no. This is where we know that as soon as we graduate, we'll get a job. And therefore, and then also in the matrimonial columns, it is said MBA, <laughs> the dowry is higher than if it's uh, not an so this kind of uh, uh, thinking is there and therefore they develop what is called as cognitive intelligence. Cognitive intelligence is to be able to reason in abstract, no mathematics, physics, you know, these are all cognitive. But the Upanishads recognizes that there are other intelligences and I was surprised to find without quoting the Upanishads or referring to the Upanishads, Harvard uh, Education Department has a course on intelligence and it has literally, in my opinion, is a carbon copy of what is there in the Upanishads. And that he says is cognitive intelligence of one dimension of intelligence. There is a second dimension of intelligence and that second dimension which I came last time when I spoke to the students, I told them to, that they should develop. That is called emotional intelligence. The capacity to know how to address people to evoke a positive response. If you say you are an idiot and therefore you won't understand, you are not going to get him as your friend. So you have to address it in such a way. Of course you can't tell everybody in soft language because some people are very dumb, they won't understand soft language. So you have to assess that. And now there is a book called by David Coleman called Emotional Intelligence. You can go to the Google and type uh, emotional intelligence and you'll get a series of books. Then there is something called social intelligence. Social intelligence is the intelligence to do things which doesn't harm society. So this harmonization, which is always at the root of Hindu thinking, harmonization. This harmonization of social good and your personal aspirations.
that requires again uh, intelligence. Then the another dimension of intelligence, which would be the fourth dimension, which is called moral intelligence, that you should harmonize your actions for your personal advancement within the moral framework, that you do not do anything unethical. You will not deprive the society of its resources. You will not engage in corruption. These have to be inculcated. If you, if you inculcate, no, no, the more much money you have, the more uh, your social status. It is not, uh, is, this is not an Indian, uh, I mean, it's not Sanatana Dharma to say making money is an end in itself. Because making money in an end in itself has already been denounced by, uh, by Sanatana Dharma. Two great rishis, when they came together to structure the society, one was uh, um, Brigu, Rishi Brigu and the other was Rishi Bhadwaj. They discussed among themselves how to structure society which lasts long and is stable. And they, Brigu then said, you see, a society can be stable only if there is a balance. And the balance can come if there are four sources of power in a society, they are uh, separated. No one has more than one of that. So he identified knowledge, weapons, uh, wealth, and uh, land as the sources of power. And he said that those who have knowledge, they should not have weapons, they should not have wealth, and they should not have land. And that was the varna called uh, uh, Brahman. It was nothing to do with wealth, because uh, people went into the field of knowledge became Maharishis, even though they were born in different, uh, different families. For example, Veda Vyasa, who wrote the Mahabharata, his mother was a fisher woman. Uh, Kalidasa, who wrote the uh, excuse me, uh, Valmiki, who wrote the Ramayana, he's popularly believed to be children, uh, a child of the Dalits, of a Dalit parents. And uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, Kalidasa is concerned, he was a hunter. And uh, Vishwamitra, who was the Rishi of Rishis, even the gods were afraid of him. He came from, a, uh, from, parent, from parents who were Kshatriyas, they were not Brahmins. But he became a Maharishi. Ravan was a Brahmin. And uh, many people didn't know that because for long years, this Dravida Kargam in Tamil Nadu used to name their uh, sons uh, as Dravanan, and used to celebrate Ravan Leela. Only recently they found out, thanks to my campaigning, that Ravan was a Brahmin. Now they have stopped talking about Ravan. <laughs> they, they only uh, do. Uh, in fact, you see, Ravan was such a great bhakta uh, of Shiva that he went to Mansarovar. And uh, there he did tapasya. And Shiva Bhagavan told him, I'll appear whenever you want me to appear. That he gave him. Even the nakshatras, he put them under this. Uh, uh, under his throne. So that kind of power he had, Samaveda he was an expert of. But he broke the law. He kidnapped somebody's wife and he was killed by Rama, who is not a Brahmin, who is a Kshatriya. And uh, all the Brahmins do not condemn Rama for saying you killed one of our Brahmins. They worship him uh, because he uh, stood for Dharma. So when, uh, when Ravan, uh, when I myself got the Chinese to agree to reopen uh, Kailash and Manzarova. The Chinese leader, Tan Xiaoping, told me on one condition, you will go first. And it was hellish because uh, you had to walk uh, up to 18,000 feet. And I'm not walked on flat land for more than one kilometer. And for me, suddenly, at least in those days, I had not walking practice. Uh, but I had to walk suddenly all the way up. And it took me 22 days to reach uh, Manzarova. And uh, when I reached on the way to Mansarovar, I saw a huge lake. So I thought that was Mansarovar. And uh, I went to, uh, uh, I told the Tibetan uh, guy who was with me that, uh, you know, is this Mansarovar? He said, no, 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 this is called Raman Haranga. So I said, what does that mean? He said, uh, Haranga is, means Sarovar in Tibetan. But Raman is an Indian name. So I said, good, let me have a, you know, a sip of this water. So he said, no, 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 if you touch this water, you will 
have uh, very bad consequences. You may even die. So in a mischievous mind, I took a bottle and took some water and sent it to Karnanidhi saying, please drink it. And <laughs> so I'm, I am saying that here is a man who comes from a Rakshas Jati. We have always, this, uh, these Westerners don't know the distinction between Jati and Varna. Varna has nothing to do with birth. And uh, Ravan, even though he was from a Jati of Rakshas, he acquired the status of Avtana. And Rama recognized that, that's why after killing him, not out of regard for Ravan, but because of the institution of Brahmins, he went and did Brahma Atya Nevan Pujaris. And he did it in Rameshwara. So, therefore, I'm saying that, that this concept of, uh, of intelligence, where this morality, is a very important part. And that includes not this craze for money. And that's how Brigu stabilized our society. That people in the highest ranks of our society, they will, uh, uh, will be only people who specialize in knowledge. And you can, they were, the, the third caste, third varna, uh, you can make money, but then you must be philanthropic to earn social status. And land, those who had land, in most countries land, people have land, have very high status. Uh, and today of course real estate companies are making uh, lots and lots of money and making, getting huge social status. But that was not the original uh, concept. So uh, this, this is what the morality question is. I, I, I would say that part of the corrupt, uh, corruption in our country is that because 